The exhibition is a somewhat unique because a number of the pictures were made here in Los Angeles um, over the last six or seven years. Aside from the new ones, there are several older ones, and none of them have ever been seen in Los Angeles before. So it seemed a good idea, almost a natural idea, that we would make the show here to give a sense of what I've done here in the city over that time. I started to work here in the 90s um, just through very, various circumstances. I didn't really have a plan, but began to come here and realized how rich an environment the city is. I think it's not just a city. Los Angeles is so big, it's almost like several civilizations almost fused together over some large area. So it seemed to me a field where I could find things that I might not find anywhere else. I didn't start out with the idea of creating any sort of personal version of this place. I'm not interested in that. I was simply interested in the individual opportunities that arose from circumstantial encounters in the in this city and its surroundings, places, people, light, etc. And it became a sort of a, a, almost a side interest of mine over the last 10 or 15 or maybe more years. And, um, and then my wife and I got a house here for our own enjoyment and that made it even more likely that I could almost work regularly here if I should feel like it. And I've done that for the last 10 years or so. So this exhibition has uh, several pictures done in the last couple of years and then some older ones combined with. I like to bring together older and newer pictures when I make shows, if I can, because I think that without me intent intending it or planning it in any way, things um, seem to relate between various pictures. They may be obvious or they may be um, more, more um, implicit, but sometimes an exhibition situation brings them out. And I'll point out a couple of those as we go along. So it's nice to, have a, it's nice to be able to show in Los Angeles and also in this gallery where the light is so good um, because the beautiful daylight in the gallery is great for col seeing color photographs. So I'll start with this large picture behind me, which was made um, in 2020. Um, and I somehow managed to get it done despite the onset of the pandemic and the lockdown, etc. I managed to slither through the problems um, and get the picture finished during that year. It's called Actor in Two Roles. And it's, the premise of it was, or the subject was very simple, that actors become different people as they take on a new role. And I think you could imagine an actor who's employed um, being one character in the afternoon in a matinee in a theater, and in the evening could be a completely different character in some other production, whether it's in a theater or on TV or something like that. Their experience would be of being different people in a continuous flow of identity change. So it's very simple. And uh, in, in order to express that, it seemed to me necessary, of course, that there should be two pictures so that we see in this diptych one of the actors in the, in the um, pair of pictures appears in both plays. Um, I think it's rather evident who that actor is, but I won't point her out because um, I'm sure you can see it visually. So the premise is very simple. An actor changes roles, an actor changes identities. How to show that? For me, it's always an issue of what photography could do that nothing else could really do to disclose, or reveal what this subject feels like, what it looks like, and in some sense what it means. 
And so it seemed necessary, a necessary structure that it should, it should be made in two pictures. I think that's obvious. Um, making two pictures means essentially making one composition in which the two pictures create a single unified um, effect. And I think you can see there's some pretty obvious ways that I went about making the picture to bring the two panels, the two images together. For example, the angle of the front of the stage, the two angles of the front of the stage which mirror each other and come together in the middle. I wouldn't like these two pictures to be hung reversed because I think they wouldn't make the unity that I designed for it. Um, and I suppose there are other factors, including the size and shape of the two stages. The picture was made in a pair of theaters that I rented in, in uh, Hollywood, in, an, in, a, in a part of the city where there are a lot of little theaters, theaters, theaters with about 50 or 60 seats. You know, there's a, there's a pretty long established theater world of these, consisting of these smaller um, stages that has been going on for probably a century, but certainly for many decades. And so I tapped into that to make the picture and I worked with actual theater companies. With, I rented the theaters from the, 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 the place that has them. The performers were auditioned through casting agents for theater, etc. The design of the sets were made by the people who do that. So in some senses, this is really a document of two stage productions that could or did exist. Both of them, both images show a, a moment, really a split second, from existing plays. They're not classic plays, they're current plays, which I found through a kind of a long, tedious process of research of what was being produced in small theaters all around the world, in fact. Because of the internet, you can easily look at websites of theaters from anywhere and see what they've put on the last few years. Finding, it, it, my intention was to find plays that would be plausible in this situation. That is, plays that would fit into a small stage, plays that would not be too expensive to put on, and plays that might likely be put on in the city. And that's a, sort of a, an assessment that I had to make about whether in fact these plays would be likely to be seen in a theater, in, in literally these theaters, and I thought they would. In fact, the play on the right, which is written by an American playwright, was put on in this theater the year before. It's one of the reasons I chose it. There are a lot of reasons for why, why I chose the plays, which I don't think I need to go into detail, except I wanted them to be very different in style. That the sense that this, the actor is um, moving from one circumstance to a very different circumstance. I could have had a, um, a children's play where they were wearing funny costumes um, in one of these plays, for example, but I did not want the actor to seem as if she was involved in a kind of more trivial act aspect of her, of, of her profession. I wanted it to seem like both of the productions were somewhat substantial and kind of meaningful and visually interesting. So that's how it got constructed. Um, so I consider these pictures almost, uh, almost documentary in the sense that I did stage the plays, and in that sense, this is a really, is staged photography, a term I don't like it, a term I don't like normally, because staged photography suggests the stage and most of my pictures don't take place on or anywhere near a stage or under any of the conditions that a stage, you know, imposes. But in this case, it, they literally are on stage, so I will call it stage photography. But in that sense, because they were, were constructed exactly how uh, a play would, would be presented and performed and rehearsed, I could almost think of them as documents of a, of a real or almost real play. And that, I think that, uh, that blend between the actual and the, and the artificial is something that I, of course, use all the time or work with all the time because I consider it one of the most interesting artistic 
dimensions of what, to, of what photography can do. This sense that it is happening and it is not happening. It happened, but it didn't happen. It happened under certain conditions, but it presents itself as having happened under other, under other conditions. Uh, I don't like the word fiction either, because I think that term is a literary, is a literary term. So I don't use that either. Most of the time, I'll just use two terms for what I do. One is uh, cinematography, which means a kind of photography that engages with the artifice that we usually identify with filmmaking, but is not limited to or captured by filmmaking, that the process of cinematography can be detached from filmmaking and become something else. And the other term that I use sometimes for this kind of work is uh, near documentary, which means, of course, it's in the, rain, in the field defined by documentary photography, which is the basic fundamental mode of photography, I think. But it isn't documentary. It's hovering somewhere near it, and it's taking up a relationship to it without being it. And that relationship is, a, I think, an interesting and complex one, which I can't define particularly, but I, I know it's there, and I know that the mainstream of documentary photography plays an important part in what I do, but it doesn't play a part by being directly present. It plays that part in some way by being absent. Shall we move to the next? Uh, this is called A Woman with a Necklace. Um, and uh, it's obviously black and white. My black and white photos are done in a traditional black and white manner and technique. So uh, there's simply uh, gelatin silver prints like have, been, like have been made for the last 150 years. And, uh, and um, I do them because I want to have uh, my repertoire of what I can do as broad as possible and, and that in involves as much of photography technically as possible. So black and white is something that has always been part of photography and I want to do it because it has its very specific characteristics. Um, I did this picture in black and white because I, the concentration for me was on the sparkling of the necklace. That is the light coming through the uh, large windows that's catching in the glass beads, the cut glass beads, that is ca somehow fascinating this woman. And I felt like the presence of color in the room, because there could be many colors in this room, would simply disperse the attention and distract your, your sense from what I think is the essential part of the picture. So it seemed like the suppression of color, the erasure of color, was important. And that's the kind of decision I think I, I, I have to make, I try to make in relationship to anything I do. There's a reason, a photographic, an inherent photographic reason, uh, a kind of inherent aesthetic reason for every decision I can't explain them all. I don't want to add them up and list them, but essentially s some things, some images, some subjects seem to require the absence of color. And I think the absence of color or the absenting of color is exciting in itself. You're looking at a picture that suddenly has lacking something that the rest of the, the room you're in doesn't lack. And that lack, that, that absence also creates a a disturbance in how you perceive. And I think that disturbance does something that pictures, when they're successful, do, which is to be almost more lifelike than life itself. And I think that I've, I've had always, always had the experience that looking at pictures that I really admire, they have a liveliness that actual, my actual experience sometimes lacks. It's so different. There are things that are in the picture that are so intensely there. And yet, of course, they're, 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 they have all the limitations of what a picture has. So, um, a woman with a necklace was, you know, in a sense, uh, a, a kind of contemplation of, a contemplation, my contemplation, of her contemplation, of a piece of property that m may belong to her. Um, I don't write the story, but I, think that there are suggestions in the picture to make it uncertain as to um, what her relationship to this room is, whether it's her house or not. Um, next to that, next to a woman, and a woman with a necklace is um, 
Another picture set in a kind of in a living room, very similar setting, only in color. Um, pair of interiors, which was made in um, 2018 in another house. This set of pictures, the actor and the woman, and this also have the common feature of sofas and lamps in them. And it seems a bit trivial to mention it, but in fact, I find it kind of fascinating that we see a variation in the theme of the sofa and lamp combination, how they're treated in different worlds and different situations. And I like that sort of simple, simple echo. It's kind of obvious that we, we're sort of in the sofa world here. And um, the, the, the sense of what a room is, what the relationship between a seating area and, a, and, and lighting is, it's just a, a kind of circumstance that came up. But sort of a, I, I, I'm happy with the way it's echoing around the, the three pictures. Pair of interiors was done um, in a real, in, a, in my, in fact, in my living room here in Los Angeles. And it came about from me spending a lot of time on one of those sofas, just uh, daydreaming, I suppose. And um, the subject, if it has a real subject, emerged in a way that I can't really explain or quite remember, but it occurred to me that um, a couple, much like me and my wife, I suppose, occupied this room in different times of day and evening and lived our life there or their life. And um, in the room, there are two facing sofas that have a space between them. The camera for the, in this picture was placed in directly in exactly in the middle of uh, the space between the two sofas. And so when it was panned this to the right, it gave that image and when to the left, it gave this image and you'll notice that the corners of the pictures, the outside corners of the pictures, uh, show the sofas at exactly the same angles. That's obvious from the fact of what I just told you. The, so the pair of sofas are not in the center of the room. Therefore, when the camera pans right and left, it doesn't show the same amount of the room in the two pictures, and you'll see there's more ceiling in one than there is in the other. That dynamic of the of the changing of the perspective was part of what I got fascinated with since I spent a lot of time in the room. The furnishings also then occupy space in a different way and the three lamps at different distances created another kind of space. So all those kind of, all those uh, rather formal things were set off by me just spending time in the room. Shall I wait a second? Sure, sure. He's got, yeah. <laughs> So I spent a lot of time in the room and somehow it occurred to me, and I can't explain it, that the couple who are going to appear in these two pictures should be portrayed by different people in each of the pictures. This, I think, occurred to me because I feel like um, I kind of, I think I have a sense of, uh, a good sense of noticing resemblances between people when I see them on the street sometimes. I'm sure everyone's had the experience of walking by walking in the street and s thinking you're seeing someone you know and it's not them, it just resembles them in their forehead or their eyes or their nose or whatever it is. It's a resemblance. It's not, they don't actually look like the person. They somehow resemble them. And I find that fascinating and I think everyone does. And so um, somehow that blended with the interest in the room itself to suggest that I could make this uh, portrayal of a couple's life, even just a few moments, on this couple's life, and probably on a single evening, in which the couple suddenly is not depicted as the same people in both pictures, but there's a resemblance between the characters who I photographed. And I, I picked them, of course, because they did give rise to that sense of resemblance. And uh, so it creates a certain unreal quality, of course, that I can't explain but I find it sort of eerie and fascinating. I suppose if you have lived with someone for a long time, there may be a, moments when you wonder whether you really know them. They might say something unexpected or do something that you wouldn't really imagine them doing, then you, or behave in a way that you find 
perplexing and then you wonder who they really are. Uh, I think that has something to, some part to play in what the subject is in the picture. I, I hung it here, of course, because it, the structuring of the relationship between the, the two pictures and the people in them is almost exactly the opposite of the actor. There you have one person playing two roles in two pictures. And here you have the very opposite situation where nobody's playing two roles. Two people are playing one role. That's a neat parallel. It wasn't planned. It just happened because of the circumstances I, I've just outlined. But I think, again, that creates a, an interesting echo between the two pictures on this kind of structural level. And so I think they really belong together in the exhibition. Uh, event was made in uh, 2021. It's quite recent. Um, two young men in some sort of uh, somewhat hostile confrontation. Uh, I'd seen, this is an example of a subject that was set up by something I saw. Sometimes that um, happens. It's kind of a regular source of subject matter for me, which, so things I actually see. Because I don't think it's required, I don't think it's re I'm required to conform to the reportage model of photography, I feel I can take a real experience um, and um, reshape it freely according to other criteria or other impulses. So where I, where I saw this event take place, I saw this event take place in somewhere different from, from how it's depicted, and that place didn't interest me. Um, there's no particular reason for that, it just didn't interest me. I didn't feel like seeing that occurrence in that place would make a kind of picture that I felt like I wanted to make. Or, thinking back, it may have been because um, I felt like I've made that picture in that sort of place before. Usually a subject becomes interesting to me only if it discloses the chance to make a picture that I hadn't made before or a kind of picture I hadn't made before, or elements of the picture at least would be something I hadn't done previously. I don't think I, don't think I always succeed in that, and I, think, and I feel that sometimes uh, pictures do resemble each other, despite the fact that I've tried not to let them do so. But, um, but nevertheless, that's my impulse. So I moved it to a different setting, and the setting is, um, I hope I'll be a, some sort of public um, meeting place or ballroom maybe of a hotel, conference center, could be a big restaurant. It's hard to say exactly. Um, but they are dressed in um, black ties, so it must be some event that would require that. It can't be defined any further than that. I just uh, reimagined re it as a dispute between two young men who had some reason to have a dispute at some event where they were both present. They probably retreated to a slightly less occupied zone um, to air their grievances and have this confrontation. I don't think they would, at least in my view, they wouldn't do it right in the middle of the say it's a party of some sort, or a gala, or a wedding, or something. They would have moved to the side. Um, and, um, and so this little occurrence, this little gesture takes place. A lot, of, a lot of these, my pictures are studies of gesture. I think the woman with a necklace is making a certain gesture. He's making, they're both making a certain gesture. And the study of gesture is pretty fundamental to what photography is and can do or at least what pictorial art is and can do, because we see a lot of this in paintings as well, or sculptures for that matter. Human figures are always gesturing in some way. So study of gesture, study of interaction, to me seems pretty fundamental. And I, I just like the, the sense in which this aggressive pointing, or essentially poking someone in the chest is really the beginning 
of a physical confrontation, or easily could be. So it has a kind of drama in it that I, that I thought would, would be really interesting. And um, I guess the mirroric sense of the two men who are of similar age, similar color, wearing a black tie, which makes everybody look pretty much the same, was another kind of fascinating aspect, which wasn't in the original um, ex event that I experienced. They weren't, they weren't, obviously weren't dressed like that. But I think that the freedom I had to recompose brought elements into the theme that to me are more interesting than the one I actually saw. It's not to say anything against what I originally saw. It could have been interesting as well, but it didn't interest me at the time. And so I feel like I'm free enough, and this whole method that I try and work in l l leaves me free enough to just make what might even be arbitrary decisions or random decisions that strike me as aesthetically, artistically more interesting than um, what I would have experienced myself. And so, um, you know, that freedom, I feel, is one of the basic things I'm trying to preserve in what I'm trying to do. And in the process, of course, composing in color, because it's really a color picture, like the black and white you saw. This is, could never really be successful in black and white, in my opinion, or at least it didn't strike me. And so one thing I love to do, and I hope you can see it, is to compose in colors. And colors are, are always the colors of the environment. Um, th this environment is a very specific one. It has this color scheme. I worked with it specifically to, I thought, make a color composition that I hadn't really made before. I don't see this picture resembling too many uh, subjects I've done before. Should we go to the next room? Uh, where will we begin? Maybe we can start on this wall because it's newer and then go to the older ones. This is a new picture made in the winter of 21 uh, called Trap Set. And it depicts an animal trap set and ready to catch, capture a, a small animal in a place where uh, these traps would be likely to be found. Um, I, of course, set the trap, um, but it was, uh, the setting of the trap was, um, was guided by um, a trapper friend of mine who I worked with closely to make sure that this picture would be as close to a documentary of a waiting trap as possible. I did not want to set a real trap and kill any animals because I wanted to be able to say that no animals were harmed during the making of this picture. Um, but uh, aside from that, it's essentially what you would see if you stumbled across this trapper's area, called this trap line, in February of a trapping season. Um, this is essentially as close to a documentary picture as one can get without it being actually one. So it's clearly near documentary. I would almost say it's near, near, or very near documentary. The term is vague because the approach to documentary or reportage is so fluid that, of course, you get there at some point. You'll get there, um, but you also may never quite get there. This picture never quite, quite gets there. Um, but everything else about it is as actual as it can be and as simple as it can be. Um, I was struck by the fact that um, a trap, a little machine, like a device, I guess you call it, like a trap, an animal trap, which is really a spring mechanism, um, is so simple and so ancient. I mean, traps have been set for probably millennia. They kind of represent in this very lowest, very low rudimentary level the almost fiendish cleverness of humans with all their devices, technology to keep us at the top of everything. And of course, keep, make, ensure that we stay at the top of the food chain where we really need to be uh, and really want to be, of course, regardless of the consequences. And that was just a fascinating subject. The waiting, the waiting intelligence, the patient 
cleverness of humans, the ability to do these things and do them on every level is, um, is pretty fundamental. So it seemed to be a subject that was just, it struck me immediately as something that would be also about photography somehow. Because of course, and we can say it because it's so obvious that the camera is structured the way the trap is structured and cameras capture the way traps capture. That's all very obvious. Um, but nevertheless, I think it, uh, it's kind of meaningful. This is the kind of picture I've made quite a few times without people. Um, some of the pictures I've made without people are sheerly documentary photographs where I've done nothing. Um, but this is in, in that domain, and I like to make them whenever I possibly can. So that's a winter picture, for sure. And then I'll move over to a summer picture, which is next to it. The trap was made in British Columbia, essentially inside the city limits of Bank Greater Vancouver, because like a lot of cities, there are areas where a lot of animals still uh, can survive. Uh, this was made in Los Angeles in the summer. It's called Sunseeker. Um, and um, it again had uh, an origin with something I'd seen, which is a woman, young woman, doing exactly what you see here um, in a parking lot. And uh, the, the fact that she had gotten on top of her car um, seemed sort of idiosyncratic, um, different, I guess. Not that it's that unusual. I think that she's a fairly small person and um, she's more likely to go on top of a car than a big person because the way cars are built these days, if you're too big, you'll just dent in the roof of your car completely because they're not made like they used to be. So she is a small person and maybe that was, that's part of the actuality of it. In any case, the woman who was sitting on the car was uh, probably sitting on a carpet or a yoga mat or something because as you know, when it's sunny, the, your car gets very hot. So um, you, won't sit on the, you wouldn't sit on the roof itself. I transposed it to another situation, but not a very different one, because I, I was passing this original woman in my own car and didn't get a very close look at the overall circumstance. It didn't go around the block to come back and have another look, which I would do sometimes. So I just let it be a kind of vague, fleeting impression. And then, as I said, with, uh, with the event, uh, worked on it more or less the same. I just changed her outfit um, and placed her against a very plain background, which is, I think, similar to where I would have found her. I, I thought it could be somewhere where her car is parked. Um, I was in the uh, warehouse a um, couple of days ago working on something to do with one of these pictures and it was got chilly in there and after a couple of hours I felt it was sort of cold and I went outside and um, stood in the sun for a little while and I realized when I was standing there that I was doing exactly the same thing that this woman is doing on top of her car which is getting out of an air-conditioned environment and getting some sun to warm up again so it seemed very natural that that's what would happen I wasn't sitting on top of my car but um, that sense of uh, wanting the sun uh, needing the heat or the radiation seem very elemental, super fundamental kind of experience that people have without even often paying attention to the fact they're having it. You know, we are kind of um, um, heliotropic organisms and that's something very basic. And so uh, it, I just wanted to capture that tropism essentially um, as being a a, a way of being that uh, emerges in any number of um, possibly unpredictable gestures. I think she's making a slightly unpredictable gesture by climbing on the <coughs> top of her car. But, you know, maybe she did, wanted to sit down and, and cross her legs, but didn't want to sit on the ground. Um, it's her car, I assume. Um, I guess it's an assumption and so on. And I think that there's a certain level of plausibility that creeps back in, even though I, I think on first glance, some people find this a bit perplexing. 
The, the term plausibility is important to me because if you are diverging from reportage and photography, it's, it's significant because uh, photographs that are known to have been taken in the normal way, that is uh, capturing an event as it takes place, as we do all the time with, uh, now with our phones, or what you know, people who carried cameras used to do, that uh, there's no question of the plausibility of the event that has been captured in that photograph because we know, or we believe we know, that um, it's, it, it, it ensures itself, it assures itself of its plausibility because it just happened. Um, we never question that, and we don't need to. But if you diverge from that procedure in photography even a little bit, then the question of whether what, you've, what you're showing is plausible immediately becomes one of the most important. So um, plausibility is an aesthetic term of reference, a critical frame of reference that I think is uh, essential and which is one of the things I have to work through in every image I make once it de departs even in the slightest from uh, the reportage model. Like with the set trap, that trap had to be set where a person who would set traps would certainly put it. Um, and therefore, I would expect a trapper to see that picture and have no question about the presence of that trap in that place at that time of year and that kind of trap. So that's that plausibility had to be reestablished in that process because I'd broken the rule of reportage. I hadn't gone and found some already set trap somewhere, um, which I suppose I could have done. And I'll say one last thing about that is I didn't do that because I found this place and I thought this would make a composition I wanted to make because, as I said, composing is what artists really do. The essential of what we do is compose things, and that's the fundamental frame of reference. So here, the plausibility seemed to be, it held up, even though at some point one could wonder what you're doing on top of a car. I don't feel that's that mysterious. Next one. Good, ready? Man in the Mirror was made in 19. That's the earliest of the set of new pictures I finished for this show, made at the end of 2019. <coughs> it was made in a hotel here in Los Angeles. And um, came, um, I'm trying to give you a sense of the starting point for myself. The writing on a mirror um, occurred to me through a memory of something I had read years ago. I won't give you the reference because it doesn't matter. Sometimes uh, a starting point, a subject, I consider a subject to be a starting point in the sense that a subject like a man looking at a mirror on which something has been written in soap. Um, or a woman sitting on top of a car getting sun, etc. A starting point is what often could be called at least the germ of subject matter. Um, and as I said, the starting point has to show me something I could do that I haven't done before. It has to show me something that is photographic in a way that I can accept. In other words, it wouldn't be very interesting as a painting, for example, uh, etc. Those starting points can come from anywhere. That's something else that I connect to what I call cinematography, which is that freedom to begin anywhere. Like a musical composer can begin with a bird song or someone, uh, some song they, that he or she heard in the street. A, a, a poet can begin with anything. You know, artists are supposed to have that total freedom, and I want photographers to have that freedom too. And I think that that freedom is, inherent in, is as inherent in photography as it is in any of the other art forms. It's just more difficult with photography because of the extra artistic function that photography has in the world, which is unique to do all this recording, factuality, etc. Photography is burdened with that, whereas music is not. 
Painting is not, poetry is not, sculpture is not. Photography is uh, just a specific condition of how photography can be artistically valid. So, um, so the starting point for me is, uh, it can be anything, but it also has to be uh, legitimate or valid in some way. So if it's, um, if it's something I read, if something someone told me, it's a daydream, kind of like what happened with the pair of interiors where it was really a kind of daydream of that room that began the picture. All those things are, are, are valid if they can be made plausible, they can be made photographic. Uh, and also if the subject, you know, seems to have some kind of uh, interest. So um, the photographic aspect of this picture is, of course, that the viewer cannot read what's written on the mirror. And the reason that you can't read it is because of the place the camera is in, which foreshortens the mirror too much and compresses the writing, and you can't, see, you can't read it. Um, so that's the essential photographic key, if you want to think of it that way. Whereas the character, of course, not only can read it, he may have even written it. We don't know. Um, I did not want it to be clear that he was writer and reader, or whether he was just reader. Um, that to me also is uh, fascinating. In a, in a way, a kind of um, ambiguity that's not that dissimilar to what we see with the uh, characters who are in pair of interiors who are not the same people in each picture. I think there's an order of a structure that's similar because we can't quite identify him as writer. We can't identify him as writer and reader. We're not quite sure. And I think that is uh, narratively interesting or literarily interesting or dramatically interesting, but it's caused by, to me it's caused by the nature of the way the thing is photographed. And again, um, I like the pictures that came out because I think the color composition is really fascinating. And um, there's something about the blue, the yellow, the red chair, and then his green shirt that makes some sort of unexpected uh, composition. Uh, he came, this young man who I hired to do the picture, he came to the hotel with a selection of his clothes, as I asked him to do. And we, of course, tried out various things in the place. And, um, and he had some very interesting outfits. But when he put the green shirt on, the whole thing just popped together in some way that uh, it didn't with anything else. That's a complete accident. I didn't ask him to bring a green shirt. I just asked him to bring some stuff. And uh, that brings up one other thing that's important, I think, to mention is that a lot of the uh, things that happen in these pictures are accidental. Um, people have said, you know, that my work is controlled so carefully and all that stuff. It's partly true. Some things, of course, I control very carefully, like where I put the camera um, and so on. But a lot of things that happen inside the making of these pictures is, is accidental. And uh, those accidents always happen. And part of my work is to um, create a relationship to the whole project that, that somehow allows that work to happen. So the, the relation between control and lack of, lack of control is pretty consistent in almost everything I've got here in the gallery and every, everything I've made for that matter. And I could talk about them again in that way, but I'll just use this as a, as a, a typical example. Parent Child um, was made in uh, 18 again, so it's an older one, <coughs> here in Los Angeles, on the corner of First Avenue, First Street and Larchmont Boulevard. I believe it's the first serious photograph ever made of Larchmont Boulevard. Um, someone who was in the exhibition with me noticed that um, Sunseeker and this picture were really a great pair because here we have the little girl who, for her own reasons, feels safe and happy and content enough to lie down on the admittedly very clean and well-kept sidewalks of Larchmont um, in the shade, and the older woman who's um, staying out of the shade and catching the sun. I love that combination. It's completely accidental. It never happened, but that's one of the reasons why I like to make these exhibitions, where these things can happen, and I feel this show is very satisfying to me because I see it quite often. 
through the pictures. And it makes me feel like I must have a style of some sort because these things are showing. I must have some, there must be some identity that I have in my own pictures that I'm not even that aware of that shows up uh, when you look over time more. Sometimes I think, um, you know, I've used a, I've talked a lot about the relationship between writing and picture making, and I feel like there's a, a literary element to all pictorial art. And sometimes I feel like my pictures must be like chapters from a novel, and that you only get to sense that novel when you have an exhibition. And then you can sort of see them as if they were telling some complicated, multifaceted story, like in interesting novels. And so exhibitions to me are, are interesting for that reason. And so when the person made that connection, which I didn't make, I was really gratified by it and, and, and even amused that it was there. Um, this came from uh, something I really did see. Uh, uh, what I saw was a photograph given to me by a friend taken around the corner of him and his daughter in exactly the same situation, taken by his friend. He sent it to me and said, this looks like one of your pictures. And I, and I have had that happen to me more than once where someone said I saw something that looks like one of your pictures and described it. And I thought, no, that doesn't really sound right, but I see what your point is. In this case, I thought, no, he's right. It really does, it is a subject that, that I could do something with. And the relationship between the father and the child to me just seemed undefinable. I can't define it, it just seemed fascinating. The fact that the little girl would do that is not that surprising and so on. Now, one other comment probably worth making is that only these two were working with me. Everything else was photographed as it really happened. So I was very lucky that this other father and his son, I, I assume that's his dad and him, they kind of look like they're, he looks like his father to me, were passing by and he looked back at those two on the sidewalk and I captured it completely as a street photographer would. But because this is a montage of more than one negative, I could put them together. And I felt that that was a very, a very beautiful uh, accident that allowed the space further away to be brought in relation to this closer space. I'm sure there was a thousand other ways this picture could have gotten finished with an, some other event taking place in the back. But, um, well, I was very happy that that happened. And that's another example of how I use accident all the time. It's blended into the whole procedure. And I think a really good depiction of California sunshine. The last two pictures in the show are older. This is Listener from 2015, um, also California sunshine. Though in fact, when I made it, I did not necessarily want it to be identified as California, just as a, a bright, sunny place. Um, and Listener is complicated to talk about, I think. It's one of the more harsh pictures I've made. Um, if, a, if a group of people get together to deal with someone, to deal with an individual, <clears throat> and bring him to such a place, wherever that may be, uh, they've clearly identified him as some sort of um, enemy or offender. Uh, and he would, of course, identify himself as a victim. And we don't know quite how to identify him, of course, because we're not part of either group. Um, and that dynamic seemed to me not only fascinating, but ubiquitous. You see this happening in the uh, world all the time, and you can go on the news and see this activity taking place in one form or another just about anywhere. Uh, and so it seemed to have a, a structure that fascinated me. It was about, and like a, lot, like a number of my pictures, it's about something happening on the ground and him being on the ground. Um, the only thing I can really say without narrating it in an illegitimate fashion is that um, in some sense when this person gets to this place any dispute that's taken place between the, him and the surrounding group has been concluded 
or one would expect it to be concluded because this seems like a, um, the outcome of a decision that's already been made. He's there for a reason. He's going to get punished, I suppose. How badly punished, we don't really know. Um, but he speaks. The picture depicts him speaking, which is not um, terribly surprising, I suppose. Um, and someone listening, a member of the group listening. And it seemed that, that uh, what, what I liked about this moment, as I imagined it, because I, imag I extrapolated it from what I could see as essentially happening in these moments, was a conversation or at least a communication breaks out at a moment when one would expect that already to be over. So I guess um, one doesn't really know when the last word is going to get spoken in situations. And so in a way this picture could be uh, kind of a contemplation of when that, where the last word in a relationship occurs. Because there always will be a last word. Um, and the term, the last word, is structured permanently because we know there always will be one. And I guess that's what the picture, in, in a way, is about, is the, the presence of the last word. And, um, and that struck me as a subject that I, I, I wanted to approach for reasons that I can't explain. Photographing down, um, I think it was really important to also bring this whole thing onto the level of the earth. And I like the fact here in the exhibition that this sits across from the trap. And I think that the trap picture and this picture are very related in terms of a lot of the thematic material that is, in be in, is shared between them. And again, in terms of the novelistic nature of the exhibition, the hot summer, cold winter, it's uh, the kind of thing that I think makes us like pictures because they do things completely different and yet they're structured very similarly. And I think that that whole experience is one of the reasons why we like to see pictures because they do these sorts of things that seem like they're narrating us a uh, truth or at least a fast, something fascinating and yet we don't really know what it is and we never can. The only way we can know that is to write the story ourselves, which is what effectively people do to some degree. This is, I think, the oldest picture here. It's made in 14, so already over seven years ago. Uh, it's called Staircase in Two Rooms. And it was made in uh, a rooming house in Hollywood. Um, I, again, uh, it's very hard to give you a clear sense sometimes of why I want to make this picture. But I did want to, for whatever reason, I wanted to depict the separation of people in their chambers, personal private spaces, uh, in relationship to a thoroughfare or a, like a main street or a plaza or whatever it happens to be. Well, in this kind of uh, building, which has two rows of um, a hallway with uh, apartments on either side of the hallway, very common on two floors. Uh, it's the staircase and the hallways that would be the thoroughfare and the rooms. Um, it just seemed like a spatially fascinating thing to do with uh, simultaneous privacies. Uh, and again, it kind of relates to the simultaneity of the, of the diptych on the other side, the actor, where the two moments you see an actor in two roles cannot be taking place at the same time because the same woman can't be in two places at the same time. Whereas this triptych is quite the opposite, where these two moments could very easily be t taking place at the same time. And one suggests that the structure of the three-part picture suggests they are, even though there's no proof that they are. There's no reason to believe that this happened on the same day as that, but it certainly could have, and they're drawn together by the nature of the three pictures put together. So we're, you know, we're, we're constantly trying to interpret why, what we're seeing. And I, I think that's always fascinating, especially when there's more than one image put together. So the premise is very simple. Show the common space, which was a kind of pretty grandiose staircase. 
uh, that really was crying out to be photographed in and for itself. I might have made the picture, just made the staircase, and it would have been the kind of picture more on the genre of the trap. But that wasn't the plan, but it certainly could have been. Um, and, uh, and then to, to pick two private spaces. That was my plan. I did depict this one, and interestingly enough, this man had just moved in, so his room was quite, well, was almost totally empty, whereas many of the other rooms in this place, which is occupied mostly by people on welfare, pretty cluttered. I'd been in quite a few of them, and in the end, I didn't want to photograph them. They were just too cluttered, and, and they reminded me too much of other pictures I've made of cluttered environments, like the After Invisible Man, which is super cluttered environment. I thought, no, I've made that picture. I don't want to make that again. So happily, he had just was moving and didn't have that. So I was happy to, to um, use him. And he was fascinating anyway. These are residents. When I was photographing the staircase, I was, my camera was obviously, say, here. And number 15 was there. And number 18, which is the even number, would almost certainly be across the hallway. Not always, because sometimes they're neighbor 15, 16, 17, and sometimes they're not. But 18 was across the hallway behind my right shoulder. And I spent quite a bit of time getting that staircase shot because there was a lot of lighting issues. And this man kept opening his door and um, looking out and listening. Didn't say anything, but he I keep hearing the door open. And I knew he was there, or I'd see him. And I'd say hello, and then he would close the door, and then an hour later he'd open the door again. And he did it all day long. And, um, and so finally I uh, began to talk to him, just chatting because he was five feet away from me. And, um, and then I said to him, could I photograph you at the door like that because you're doing it? And he told me he was listening for various gripes he had about things going on in the building. Uh, so he let me photograph him just as he was. And I, and I made that shot, which was not the shot I planned to make. I had planned to make another interior. And, um, and I, I didn't in the end. I used him in that way. And again, that's an accident. That was a major accident that changed this project completely from how it, I had envisaged it, which was more of a symmetry, a balance between two different interiors, which would have been kind of interesting to see this person's space and then this person's space, would have been interesting. But this was more interesting in a way and formally much more exciting. And it made a much more interesting triptych than the original idea probably would have. There's another good example of how even with a lot of planning and kind of pre-thinking about the whole thing and composing and etc., that total uh, circumstance would occur. In that sense, you know, there's a sense that there's a trace of genuine reportage in this picture because that's what happened. And uh, although he did it again for me, um, he didn't do anything different than he did 20 times a day. So there's a, you know, the thread of what reportage is is in the project, even though it doesn't exist actually. It's, a, it's almost like a phantom element of reportage. And so I think there's a phantom element in all of these pictures because you know these things didn't really quite happen. And, um, and I know that violates this social identity of photography. It really is a violation or a departure at least from the dominant social notion of photography. But the unreality of things, the fact that they didn't quite occur, and yet you can't not experience, you, you must experience them as if they're occurring because there it is right in front of you. Um, and as long as it remains plausible, as I said earlier, as long as the plausibility survives, then you are forced to relate to them as if they're happening, even though we know they're not happening. But we also know that um, in paintings, things aren't happening. In artworks, actually nothing's happening. They're only f illusions of things that are happening. And that illusionism is you know, inherent in the arts, visual arts anyway. It's always been there, and illusionism plays a very complex role in photography. And so I've tried, you know, I'm trying to play with that, or at least work with it, uh, in everything. Last comment, I was looking for a rooming house or an apartment building. Happened to be driving down a street in Hollywood one night. 
hot night, summer, door was open. I saw this room, in this, I could see down the hallway into this, um, to see the staircase in a flash, a bit like seeing the woman um, on the top of the car. And, and immediately knew I was going to, I wanted to try and photograph that staircase because the colors are pretty fantastic. Um, and so, of course, I managed to arrange it with the, with the owner. But again, it was, I was looking for a place and I happened to find this place. And that's another sort of contingent element. Just like Larchmont Boulevard was contingent because my friend's uh, kid and him were on Larchmont Boulevard. Contingency is, you know, just inherent in any image. But that one was, um, again, sort of, sort of fascinating because the color leaped out into the street at night. Um, and you must admit that is a, fasc a fascinating color ensemble.